a, a very good evening and a warm welcome to a special edition of the North Bank Summit Show. Um, it is linked in with the Cannon and Jonesy um, show. And today we have a very special guest with, with us. And that's not Jonesy himself for once. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it is. I just want to say a massive thank you to Andy. Um, would have been known as Andrew Mockler, um, a few former Arsenal youth player um, at the club in the in the in the eighties. We will kind of discuss his career in whole um, throughout the show. Um, but first and foremost, before I introduce Andy, just want to say good good evening to Jonesy. How you doing, mate? Um, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay after um, last night. I'm not too bad, to be fair. I'm not as bad as half of Twitter today, but yeah, I'm do, I'm doing well. Yeah, it's been it's been a bit of a special meltdown, hasn't it, over, over the last twenty four hours? <laughs> um, thank, thank you very much, Jonesy, and obviously a good evening to Andy. How you doing, mate? Really good, thanks. Yeah, and thanks for the invite on the show. No, it's an absolute honour. And just to obviously let you guys know, um, and Andy, um, as I said, would have been known as Andrew Mockler at the time, um, signed as an Arsenal schoolboy um, in nineteen eighty four. Um, he then joined. At, as the apprentice in 1987, um, his first pro forms were then obviously signed in 1988, where he stayed in the club up to including 1990, um, which would have been in a, a special era at the club as well. And we will kind of discuss that later around An Anfield 89. Um, and then he signed for Scarborough Football Club between 1990 and 1994. And we even maybe, potentially, if it pulls off, got a few goals to show you in that time. Um, never. never. <laughs> just a couple, mate. Just a couple. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Andy. Um, well, firstly, obviously, welcome to the show. Um, yeah, just tell us a bit more about yourself. Well, it what my, my, kind of my footballing self? Yeah, just yeah, yeah, your footballing career basically. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it, it all kind of started when I was at school, and you know, I was I was a kind of decent player at, across our region, and I had a few clubs that were looking at me, including my local club, Middlesbrough. Um, but ultimately, I, I trialled a few of these clubs, um, which were all great in their own ways. But yeah. the second I went down to Arsenal, um, it was just like a different, it was just a different world. So and it, and it just essentially progressed from there, really. That's when I signed my schoolboy form. So every school holiday is down there training, um, just dreaming, hopefully, to, to be offered a place as an apprentice. And luckily that came through in 87 when I left school and went down to serve my apprenticeship which I guess we'll talk about a bit later, but um, yeah, that was amazing times. And then Sam, my pro forms on my 18th birthday, which was yeah, probably one of the proudest moments of my life. And then, uh, yeah, continued through to 90, where ultimately George Graham pulled me in the office and said, we're going to have to let you go. And then I went on to, and then really luckily, I, I kind of, I, I moved on to a club that was quite close to home in the Northeast at Scarborough. And a friend of mine, uh, a lad called Tommy Mooney, who some of you guys might know, um, yeah. played for Watford and various clubs. But we grew up together. And there was a few of us that kind of knocked around together, Tommy being one. And we both went to Scarborough. We just decided to do it together. Um, and I had a you know, phenomenal three or four years at Scarborough as well. In fact, in Scarborough, which I guess we'll talk about soon, but I actually scored a goal, believe it or not, that actually got us through to the next round of the Cup, which then got us a home draw against Arsenal. I was so I got to see my old mates again then. Yeah, I was going to say to you, like, I, I, do you know what? I was meaning to look it up, but yeah. I was I was thinking about it and I was thinking we definitely played Scarborough at some point around in the early 1990s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was when it was really foggy. Um, the first fixture, I'm pretty sure it was called off um, and because of the fog. And then we had the, the night it was on, which I think was the, either the following week or the week after. It was still horrendous conditions because it was Scarborough. Um, it was probably it was probably August actually. That's just Scarborough for you, but um, yeah. Then then we got Arsenal then and uh, in the cup, so it was magic for me just to kind of see the guys again. So yeah, yeah. Nineteen ninety two to nineteen ninety three, fourth round. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So yeah, we 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 beaten Plymouth in the previous round. Um, yeah, which was massive. But all the local stations have picked up on the fact that I've got like an ex. Arsenal background so once that goal was scored it was that that, that was for me was kind of my little 15 minutes of fame I suppose but yeah you're, you're, times. you're, you're basically ripping in I'm a bit worried James he's ripping into our 15 questions already <laughs> have I <laughs> maybe well, so mate maybe so but we're I'm here to test yeah you've got to try and change that on the fly now <laughs> yeah we're definitely discussing though anyway and find out <laughs> yeah. exactly um if we have, if you have ripped in some of them, but no, well, we got fifteen questions for you, and as I said, like obviously there are fifteen questions that me and Jonesy are going to alternate. So I'm going to football let you questions. 
I'm going to let you do the they first. They are football questions, aren't they? You're not going to trick me with some history stuff. and Yeah, they're all football questions. Science and nature. Yeah, yeah, they're absolute all football questions. Um, and there's no stitch up on this one whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> That's fine, yeah. Um, I'll go. I'll tell you what, Josie. I'll fire away with the first one, and then you can go away with the next one after that. Yep, no worries. So, obviously, just being a childhood, obviously growing up as a football player, as you said, like obviously you had quite a lot of clubs going into you. What was the exact reasons why you chose Arsenal at the end of the day? Um, two of the big reasons uh, were two guys at the club at the time. Um, actually, three. There was um, Terry Murphy, who was the youth development officer. Um, just an incredible Mr. Arsenal kind of guy, old school values. Um, Steve Rawley, bless him, not, no longer with us, but Steve Rawley, who he went on, he had a phenomenal career actually with Arsenal. He was going abroad and looking at um, foreign, potential foreign players coming over to us, but he, just an amazing bloke, uh, an amazing guy. And Steve Burtonshaw, another guy that was fundamental to the especially to the youth side of um and the reserve side of arsenal they were just incredible it was the professionalism the way they looked after us that's not to say that other clubs i went to didn't look after us but it was just a different it, it was just a different feel at arsenal it was it, it was just class i think that that's probably the the way to put it and even me as a schoolboy then you, you looked after so well you don't want for anything and even when you're a schoolboy in your trial and they still instill that kind of what it means to play with that gun on your shirt and all that kind of thing and yeah it was it kind of blew me away really when i was a kid to to be around people like that who were just so positively arsenal yeah and uh, yeah it was just proper just amazing guys amazing fellas really i'll let you go with the next one josie yeah cool just before i jump into the question i just want to say good evening to everyone we've got loads of people in the chat at the moment we've got g craig Tariq, brooksy loads of them um, hello all tuning in to see uh, this next question, which is a really bad one. Are you ready? Oh, I'll be here. If not right no, forward. no, it's not. It's all right. Um, what was your favourite club as a child and why? <laughs> um, I would say Spurs. Whatever yeah. You know, right, <laughs> this is where I'm going to get an absolute barrage of hatred. But <laughs> probably uh, Middlesbrough was my local team. So the Borough was always my team. That, Like my grandparents went to watch the Borough. They stood on the old gate and watched the, the games. And my first games were at Middlesbrough. But growing up as a kid, when I first got interested in football, I, just, I loved Glenn Hoddle. Mm. I loved Glenn Hoddle. I loved the way he plays. I, I, I thought he looked class with his rolled up shorts and his little tag sticking out of his socks. He just looked immaculate. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really sorry, guys. But but that was the only time, and believe you me, uh, there's, a, there's a deep hatred for them now. But, but as a kid, Tottenham were kind of a likeable team for me as well. But So Tottenham and Borough, I would have, I would have said. Sorry. No, well, the, the, the next the next question, which probably goes into it, is that was I was going to ask you your childhood um, hero was as a player. Yeah, yeah. Um, growing up. So, so Glenn Hoddle was massive. Um, also, Brian Robson at United used to love watching him play. Um, um, we used to go and watch the Borough play quite a bit. So there was there was lads over there that little like a local legend, Bernie Slaven. You know, they're, they're all players that you're on the playground, you want to be them, you want to be the number seven and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, he had a few, but th they were probably the main ones, the two midfielders and Slavin, just because he was a local hero, really. Good stuff. Cool. Next one over to you, Jonesy. Yep. Yeah. Um, who was the best player that you played with and why? Yeah, great question. Um, so that, does it include training every day and because I, I might i haven't played a match against this person but well, you, it, yeah yeah one have one in training potentially and one that you uh, think you'd against yeah, david the david rawcastle in david rawcastle by a mile um he was just incredible man you know he was always the one that we always looked up to as kids coming through because he'd done the same thing himself um such a grounded bloke as well but um yeah he was trying to get the ball off him in little short-sided games or even the bigger size games, it was just a waste of time. He was that good. He just, he just always seemed to have time. He always had space, and, and that individual ability to just change a game in, in a in a quick moment. And he did it in training, um, just the same as he did, as we've seen on the telly in in, in massive games. But so in training and and the likes, it would be David Rawcastle um, played against. It, it's probably going to be Alan Shearer when we. Um, and when I was at Scarborough, we, we drew Southampton in the, 
or what's now the Carabao Cup, or I think it was the Coca-Cola Cup then. But we played against Southampton at the Dell, which was a, you know, it was a, it was a tough fixture for us as a league three side or whatever it was. Um, and just seeing him and the way he battered around our centre-backs, who were quite big brutes themselves, but also having the presence of mind to bring players into the game, um, and his score and finesse, probably Shearer. He had just had an aura about him, even at a young age. It's quite interesting as well, because obviously when you played with him, it was in his early early part of his career, wasn't it? But Yeah, yeah. And what yeah. a career he had as well, when we look at it, that he left Southampton, went to Blackburn, um, won the title with them. Yeah. And then it's just... actually, it's Matt, just on that because um, when I was one of the one of the teams that I trialed and, and wanted me to go down there was Southampton, and I was actually invited to a Gateshead Centre of Excellence thing that Southampton had set up, and I was actually there the night when Alan Sheen signed schoolboy forms for for Southampton. We had like a a, a, a whole night inside a five a side hall essentially, but they made a big thing about that when their players signed. They made a really big thing about presenting them with oh, with all sorts. And I was there that night when she resigned his, um, his schoolboy forms. Brilliant. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And it was just a little yeah. skinny thing. He was like, honestly, he was like a little skinny thing. You could see there was a good footballer in there and he could finish like there's no tomorrow even at that age. Um, but when I next seen him a few years later, when I was coming through the youth team at Arsenal and then we played them at Southampton, it was like, Jesus, man, this guy's just become a beast. It was just, he'd, he'd become like a... Bit like, bit like we had Kevin Campbell, they had like Alan Shearer, very similar kind of ways that they played, strong, physical, quick. Yeah, so, so pro- yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting. So there you are. It's a little story for you then, Shearer, yeah. No, mm. it's quite interesting. So when anyone ever used to ask me, my favourite player outside Arsenal in the Premier League era, first player I'd go to is probably Alan Shearer. Yeah, yeah. And if it, I always think if he had signed for Manchester United instead of Newcastle, how good would a Man United have been? <laughs> oh. Would have been scary. Yeah, yeah, would have been scary. My best mate would have been happy. But um yeah, um yeah, it would have been he should have went there. We I think we all know that now. Even yeah. Gas Gascoigne at the time was a big thing in the northeast. Gaza should probably should have went there as well. But yeah. There you go. Two big players never went there. Mm. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, well you kind of answer the next question. So <laughs> great. Because it was who, who was the best player you played against. So the next one I'll go into is who's the best manager you've worked under and why? Um, oh, but that's pretty easy. That's Pat Rice. Um, just again, talking about when I talked about the three guys Steve Burtonshaw, Terry Murphy, Steve Rowley. Pat Rice wasn't really involved with the with the schoolboys as such, he was more with the youth team and, and the reserves. So, when I um, when I first went down there and I was under Pat Rice, I mean, not only did he scare the shit out of me, but he, he starts to instill what it is to be an Arsenal player, but to what it is like to play for Arsenal. Not only how you are on the pitch, but how you conduct yourself away from the place. And he he's he was fundamental to all of that. Proper old school kind of coach, but he uh, he had that ability to absolutely knock like shoot you down in flames one moment, but then make you feel like a million dollars the next. And he was just incredible. We, really? the, the lads would run through brick walls for him. Mm. That that's what he kind of brought to to the club. And I think if you looked at the players that kind of came through, there was some phenomenal talent that broke through and into the first team and they've essentially come through Pat. He was fantastic, Pat. Just remember oh. sitting there my early years obviously as a young Arsenal spotter, you know, with sitting there next to Wenger and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. He was around for a long time around the club and he was, you know, most of Arsenal went right through him, didn't he? He bled Arsenal and completely such an amazing guy. I met I had the pleasure of meeting him a few times. He was always polite and you know down to yeah. spend every minute of the day talking to you about Arsenal football, he had to be ushered away from us. That was like, stop. Yeah. yeah he would not stop football. chatting. He's like, he's like your nan or your granddad. He just won't stop Brilliant. talking. But yeah. yeah. It's great. Absolutely great. Yeah. His knowledge, his knowledge was just incredible, man. It's just, yeah, he, was, he kind of brought me on as a player. He brought, brought aspects to the, to, to football that I'd never even seen before. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah, just amazing. Cool. Uh, next question. I know you mentioned Rowcastle, but is there anyone else who is your biggest inspiration in football and why? Uh, biggest inspiration. Um, I think again, going back to um, to Brian Robson. I think at the time, because he, the guy suffered with like so many injuries because of his the way that he played. He was he was kind of all out. The way that he would return, like he'd come back from injury, and it was just that sheer presence about him. And I remember seeing him in the in the players' tunnel actually before one of the matches at, at Highbury when I, we were just walking around to get sat in our seats. 
And I couldn't believe the size of him. I like because you see him on telly and you think, you know, he's a unit. But actually, when you saw him up close, he, he was like a beast. Mm. Um, and and I think just the way that he conducted himself as well, um, he was probably to United what Pat Rice was to Arsenal. I guess he would, you know, United through and through in the end. Yeah. Um, so I think probably Brian Robson. Um, and he, he scored a goal in the World Cup on the day my sister was born as well. So. Got that with Brian Robson as well, yeah. <laughs> good day that was. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? I think that was a good day that one then. Yeah, it was a great day. Yeah, yeah. My dad was a happy man. <laughs> um, it must have. Oh, I tell that. I bet it was a tough one as well, wasn't it? Was that well? Was that an, an? Was that a World Cup game? Or was it just? A, yeah, it was. Do you remember the World Cup when we scored against France after about twenty six to twenty seven seconds or something? Yeah. Brian Robson scored. So yeah, it was that World Cup? Oh, brilliant. Oh, that be eighty. Yeah, I should know that was my sister's birthday, but. <laughs> 86, is it? 86, probably. Yeah, 86. Yeah, yeah 86. it was, yeah. yeah. It's actually the first World Cup I remember. Jeez. It was 82. I was not okay. Yeah, God. I want to get absolutely <laughs> shot out of you when I get back. I was born in 86, lads. Sorry. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Johnny. This is a bad reception, mate. Um, yeah. <laughs> Dear God. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> um, in terms of your footballing career, what's your yeah. favourite moment in your career and why? Um, my favourite moment initially, well, when I signed, when George Graham pulled me in the office and said, we want to sign you as a professional footballer, um, that that was just one of them kind of pinch me moments, um, just sat in that beautiful office of his and just to see the presence of George Graham being sat there and saying that he wants me to stay on as a pro was incredible. Um, so that one, but also when I was at Scarborough, um, we just kind of spoke about it briefly, but I managed to score a goal against Plymouth in the coca-cola cup they were about a league above us or maybe two leagues above us but peter shilton was their manager and he was the player manager and i managed to score against him so that that was a special moment when i i'd scored the goal and it just distinctly remember briefly looking back and seeing peter shilton on the floor with his heads in his hands and it was just one of them kind of surreal moments where you think god like one of my heroes growing up and there he is on the floor because of me so yeah that was a special moment that was a great night for the town as well it was a, it was a big result what I'm going to try and do, and I'm going to try and be clever here, so it might, we might get a bit of a delay. I'm going to try and show everyone that goal um, that obviously Andy's talking about. So this is obviously against Peter Shilton um, back in 1992. Um, this, will, this will be grainy footage. <laughs> let me just get to the right screen. I'm going to, just let me know, James, that you can see it when it's playing. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's playing. So I've, oh, turned yeah, the mute, I've turned the mute down on it, so... So there's Darren Foreman. So, the, yeah, so we've got a, this is late on in the game. It's 1 1. We drew 3 3 at their place, which got us the replay. And then this was about yeah, 10 minutes to go, maybe. I can't remember. It was close to the end, and we got this free kick. And I'd come off the bench. I'd been a sub that night. And, and this was one of my first touches. <laughs> and uh, it was just a hit and hope. Manages to. There Ooh, you go. Scores bang. Two. And there's uh, that. That, that brief little look back there, yeah. Look at the kids, very similar to Arsenal as well. Number 14 as well. Great number. Was, yeah, Thierry. But I was actually, I was only 14 because I was on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was, was, but, was squad numbers a big thing back in those days? Like, no, no, there weren't. Big big on, no. no, there was no squad numbers. No, you you were just hoping to get one of the one of the 11 on the match day. There were squad numbers in the training ground. So you, you had your training squad numbers, but not, not like it is these days with... Numbers up to 99 and what have you. Yeah. What, what was what while we we're at it, and I want to roll with this, we might as well <coughs> have a quick look at your other goal. Um, this was against Southampton. So this is the one that obviously that you said yes. that um basically was when you played against Alan Shearer. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they were a, they were a, actually they were having a tough season that year, but they were a decent outfit, like Letitia was playing and um one of the scariest men ever, Terry Herlock, was playing. <laughs> So let's um, play this. So these, here we go. That's so, them, yeah. Yeah, so you imagine, like, so they, these are like, well, they would now be Premiership and we were kind of League Three. Mm. Um, so this was a big, you know, tough night for us. We went 2 0 down quite early at the Dell and, uh, yeah, we managed to pull it back somehow. So it was, uh, it was a pretty special night. But, uh, yeah, we were under the cosh for a lot of it. And uh, I think Gary Imsworth scores a great goal here, yeah. Gary Ames with their scoring for us. And then we got a penalty late on. Was you the penalty taker? Was you the penalty yeah, taker? I was. I was the penalty taker, yeah. Yeah. And I had a pretty decent record. I only missed one. But, um, 
yeah, I, I managed to score past a few decent keepers. Do you remember, do you remember Peter Hooker? Played in goal for QPR in the FA Cup final years ago. He managed to score a penalty past him. And uh, an old, <laughs> quite an old fat keeper called Barry Siddall, brilliant keeper, by the way. <laughs> he, saved, he did save a penalty, but he must have been about 18 stone at the time. And uh, really? how, the hell he got, how the hell he got down to it, I'll never know. And that, that one there was against, that was Tim Flowers in goal there. <laughs> Tim yeah, he, right. and he, he he was a good goalkeeper as well, yeah, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, a bit crazy, but yeah, he's a really good goalkeeper. So there, there's two there's two of your finest. Um, Thank you. Yeah. In terms of, in terms of obviously footballing teams, obviously as you said, the Southampton one, um, they were two 0 down, but the second one um, got you the the tie against Arsenal in the next round. It, yeah, yeah, which was yeah, it was just brilliant. It was amazing. Brilliant. Um, next question was it you, Jonesy? Yeah, so they were the happy times. Um, so what was your worst moment in football and why? Um, the worst moment in football was back in the same office with George Graham when uh, he, he pulled me in and had to sit me down. Probably one of the worst parts of his job as well. But to, just to say that it, it just you need to we need to move you on. Mm. It's not working out for whatever reason. Um, but we'll do all we can to help you move on and, and find your next club. And, and, and then they did, you know, at, just a typical class club. Uh, made sure that players that were released were looked after as well as the, you know, as we moved on. So, um, yeah. So that that was that wasn't a good day um, for sure. Can you can you remember much of it? Was it like, like I don't I don't want to bring up bad memories, Joe. You know I mean, yeah, but, yeah, you know, it's, it's fine. But it, it was it's you know Arsenal's obviously a massive club. But it, was it? Yeah. Did, did the thought in your mind ever go like, oh? this could be me, the end of it all? Was you always that focused and that determined that you was going to make it somewhere else? I think at the, at the time, it was a mixture of feelings because mm. the ultimate feeling at that particular point was just devastation. I, could, yeah. I couldn't imagine my life without Arsenal Football Club, like yeah. going into Highbury every day and uh, going over to Colney doing your trip. It, it, was just, it just became such a part of your life. Mm. And the lads that you that you train with, youth team reserves, first team, because George Graham was very much into making sure everybody was together all the time. There was never like any sort of segregation. Um, and just thinking that I'm, I'm losing all of that as well, something that you establish over a few years. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, so it, it was a really tough one to take. And, you know, you're 19 year old and my only dream was to play for the first team. And then obviously that's taken away from you. It, it's a tough one. Um, but... I think going to Scarborough was it worked out really well for me, though. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that that was a horrible day, horrible day, and I, and I didn't envy George having to do that job as well. I mean, I, considering the time that he had there, he, he, used, he used to always say that the the one job he hated the most was was telling people that they weren't right, you were moving on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a tough one. Yeah, really tough. And this picture up here, do you remember this game? Yeah, that was against Tottenham. That's at Tottenham's training ground. It was at Mill Hill. Did we win? Um, no, we drew nil nil actually that game. Um, that lad, the number eleven there, was facing me. Gary McCune was a cracking player. Yeah, he was a excellent football player. But yeah, we that that was at Mill Hill. Cool. Um, the next question: um, What what's the best goal that you think you've scored in in your career? The best goal I've scored. Yeah. Oof. Um. I could tell you anything now because they're not even on camera. So I could tell you what, about all these worldies when I took everybody <laughs> on three times. No, I, 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 th there was a couple of goals actually in the Arsenal youth team. I, scored, I managed to score a hat trick actually away to Fulham, and um, one of the goals I caught it on the volley in the edge of the box and just caught it pretty sweet and it flew in. That was a good one. And I scored a decent goal against West Ham at London Colney. Um, Billy Bonds was actually in charge of the West Ham team. So we had Billy Bonds one side and Pat Rice on the other. You couldn't get two more mm. total club men running the thing, running the teams. But um, yeah, Scott, I chipped the keeper on that one. And so that, that was a bit special. Never forget that one as well. And then the Shilton one was great for me because that one I have got on camera. And uh, yeah, just the memories that go with that. Brilliant. Next one over to you, Jonesy. Yeah. Who was your closest teammate? My closest teammate? <laughs> Um, in fairness, I had a few because the lads, it was such a close knit group of players. But, um, there was a lad from Sig Cup in Kent called Jamie Donnelly, he used to play for England schoolboys. Jamie Donnelly was a good mate. Kwame Ampadu, 
um, was a really good mate of ours as well, a, a good mate of mine. We used to often, because we both lived in digs in different areas, we'd often um, get together, go and play snooker or whatever. And probably Raymond Lee, another lad that came through the youth with me and yeah, very similar. He lived in a different part of London, um, but Raymond was a class bloke. But again, that that's not to say that the whole bunch of guys that were there right throughout the club were just incredible. And I'll just pull this one up. I know we got us, you said about taking some pictures of of, of Twitter. This one's a team sheet um, between Arsenal and Crystal Palace. Oh, yeah. Um, back in, oh, wait a minute, let's see if I can get it closer. <laughs> um, back in 1989. Um, a reserve game. Yeah, it's a reserve yeah. game. Sorry. Oh, let me just yeah. get, let me get it closer for you. Oh, no, I've totally gone out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. Totally screwed that one up. Um, That's good effort. I'll, I'll go. I'll go. I'll just speak for it. Obviously, at the time, um, there was quite a lot of key players just coming through the system at that point. Um, that I was looking at and thinking that they did kind of make a career at Arsenal. Um, and I was, yeah, oh, I've totally lost it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Um, so obviously, in in the, in the team that day, we, we had obviously Stephen Morrow that obviously yes. went went on to score the winning League Cup final in 1993. When I first went down to London, my the digs I was supposed to stay at, the couple were away on holiday, so I had about four weeks at a different set of digs, which were in Enfield, and that was with uh, with the family there, and I was in with Stephen Morrow for for four weeks before I moved then into my own digs. But yes, good night, Stephen. He, he spent quite a lot of time at Arsenal, isn't he? Like in terms of kind yeah. of in the background scenes over the years as well. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Good to see. Um, Paul Davis, he, do you know what? Paul Davis is one of my dad's favourite players. Same, what a, player. same. What a bloke as well. Just, he was almost like a quiet assassin. Um, but he was just a phenomenal football player. What a, what a first touch, and just a bit of awareness about him. And then you look at his physique, and he was quite thin, quite lithe, but he was as strong as an ox man. You didn't see him get knocked off the ball very much. He had great balance, and just a proper down to earth guy as well. So humble. Brilliant player. Um, Kevin Campbell. Um, <laughs> the Kev class. I mean, uh, coming through the youth team with him, he was a year older than me, so I, I kind of joined the youth team when he was in his second year. Yeah. But even just training with him, playing matches with him, and yeah, we played loads. He broke all sorts of scoring records at the time. Proper gr great guy as well. Proper good block. And and David Hidia as well. He went on as well. Yeah, yeah. Played for us player. quite a bit. What a player. Yeah. Um, you, you could just from even from a young age, you could just tell there was something about Dave. He just had this kind of leadership quality that kind of emanated from him, really. Um, again, another one, proper, like really grounded, just a, yeah, a good good lad and a great player. Cool. Um, next question. Do you have, what, what's your biggest regret in football, would you say? Finishing when I did, I think. When I look back now, I think probably I, I, I when I walked away from Scarborough, at the time I thought I was fed up. I thought, that, you know, that, and I think... I moved away from Scarborough, probably a bit too young, really. Yeah. There'd been interest from other clubs. Um, but I was just, at the time, I'm young, I'm kind of inexperienced. I didn't bother with agents and um, kind of dealing with the issues that were going on there. So I think probably that. I mean, I delved into non-league football, but hated it. I think the, the soul had been ripped out of me when I left Arsenal, to be honest. And I had a great time at Scarborough, but I was never the same person as when I first went down to London. I think you find that with a lot of players that maybe do get released that quite often you'll see them in lower leagues or you'll see them playing non-league football and you're like, what, 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 what's going on there? But it, it's such a hard thing to get over that, that devastation of being released from, from the club that you just idolise. You know, you just you, you would literally do anything for that club. So I can, I can totally understand why players do sometimes drop away. And then I've got I mean, complete admiration for these players that take that release on the chin and literally roll up the sleeves and think, right, I'll, I'll show you. And some players who do that again, just phenomenal. Yeah, it is interesting when you. I even think about some of our youngsters that don't or might make it, but not make it overall, and then we sell them on. Mm -hmm. And you always hear, especially from our Howling kids, and, I, and it's, it's such a positive thing. I was listening to Ainsley make the nulls the other day, and he was saying like, cause he scored that winner, didn't he? That penalty in the, the penalty, night. yeah, high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, but, but, <laughs> there's any ever case you want to take penalty? Yeah, he's he's quality, him. isn't he? Yeah, yeah. But he was just still talking highly about Arsenal and how he looks out for their results and all that. And you can imagine, like, if you're an Arsenal player and an Arsenal fan, how hard it can be. Like you're saying, if you do leave the club, so then. It's not easy, is it, to go into another no, club not. and just settle in? 
and that 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 also i mean you when you leave arsenal the only way when you're getting released the only way is down mm -hmm. essentially because just the sheer size and and what, what arsenal stands for and what it's about everywhere else moving on from there is is going to be a step down and that's sometimes quite hard to take as well because there's not many I mean, i've spent a bit of time at quite a few clubs there's nothing like arsenal and I know that might be me with blinkers on, but there isn't. You, you look at any footballer, even today, the young kids that are coming through and the ones that kind of come through and make it to the first team, your Smith Rose, your Ainsley Merton Niles coming through and doing what they've done. They'll always speak so highly of the club because of the way the club is. It's a, it's a special place, it really is. Mm. Sadly, you don't, you know what? You don't realise until you later in life how lucky I, I actually was. I wish I could have a bit of me now. Yeah in my head at that particular point to actually realise how lucky I was to be there because at the time you just take you know I was I was fairly good at a young age and so you just kind of take it for granted that you know I'm going to go there I'm going to do well and you know I'm a, I'm a decent player but then all of a sudden you go there and you've got all these great players around you but you, you you're all brought through like brothers in arms really so mm. yeah family yeah. club yeah. absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah yeah Okay, uh, next one. What was your favourite game you ever played in and why? Favourite game I ever played in? Do you, do you know what? For the, there was a game that nobody really know about, but we, as Arsenal youth team, we went to a tournament in San Sebastian in, um, in Spain. And um, that was Real Sociedad's home ground was there. But we, all the, the matches were played at their training grounds, I think it was. Mm. But we, in our group, we had Real Sociedad, Barcelona, and one other kind of was now it might have been ajax actually anyway but we played barcelona and they, they were like the spanish champions at the time youth team wise and we absolutely tore them apart we were brilliant that day and i probably had my best game in an arsenal shirt in that on that particular day it was roasting out there as well so like we, we were all flagging like crazy but in the spanish guys were just running around like it like it was no tomorrow it was just really easy for them mm -hmm. but um we were we were absolutely amazing that day we just all raised our game i think for whatever reason it just everything came good and that was just special because we all came off and we knew we'd absolutely turn them over big style wow that was good yeah amazing <laughs> yeah and my league debut for scarborough was it was it was it just for sentimental reasons that was phenomenal as well against mm -hmm. gillingham Brilliant. Um, yeah. Next, next one. Favorite ground and why? Oh, it's, I, it, no, it's just Highbury. All, always Highbury. Um, you know, I, I was at the Emirates on Sunday. I was lucky enough to get tickets off the club actually, but um, the Emirates is stunning and what what a place to go to. But Highbury, yeah, it was just something else, wasn't it? I mean, for those of us who were fortunate enough to be around when Highbury was around, the place was just special absolutely extra special walking in them marble halls mm. like i used to walk in there every day and every day I'd, you'd be like oh my god look at this like that bust of herbert chapman in front and then we take a right going down to the changing rooms it it was just every day you just thought i'm a part of this and then made you really feel a part of it as well that you've worked hard to get here and now it's about what we do to kick on and yeah highbury was just different class and when, and when the crowd were on it at highbury there was nowhere better mm. it was just brilliant do you take yourself down there when you go down there to always yeah yeah okay. i didn't we didn't get down at the weekend but um i normally um have a little walk down there and just I'd just stand outside the front look up you know just flash back to getting there early in the mornings loading the bus up with the kit driving to colony getting back making sure the kit was sorted cleaning this we, we used to clean the stadium on a friday <laughs> the youth team that that was that was just part it was like almost like an army thing but we had to clean the stadium on a on a friday when i say the stadium it was like the changing rooms the corridors these are marble floors by the way it was class it was they're just us cleaning them um manager's office the staff room um yeah that, that was our responsibility and then pat rice would then walk around it literally and he'd be like wiping his fingers across the top of the toilet doors and if that wasn't right honestly you would get run into the ground by him so you you, you kind of lived in a in, in it there was a bit of fear in of Pat because of the way that he was and the wit and the just the values and and the levels that he instilled. But by Christ, it made us into men. Yeah, um, it's just taking me back when I used, my dad started taking me in the mid eighties, and I don't know if you ever remember it. You probably, I'm sure you will. But yeah. I used to always sit right next to the dugouts where George Graham was. But there yeah, was yeah. Like, it was all standing. There was a board, weren't there? And all the kids used to sit on the board. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just brilliant so, memories. Just oh, that's cool. I mean, memories. we used to sit as youth team or reserves just behind the dugout. So I don't know whether there was like a little tiny yeah. area. Best seats ever, man. Because you watch all the players coming on and off the pitch, getting a feel for the atmosphere and just wanting to be, just aspiring to be one of them that's out there. But yeah, it was just a, yeah, class place. The Emirates is brilliant, but it'll, it'll never be Highbury. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. Yeah, I do as well. I had the pleasure of going there at the young age, you know. Um, I was yeah. there for the last when you know, the last day when it was all closing really, down. Yeah. I still, still got my bit of grass. It's in my still airtight container. Have you? Yeah, I've got you? a bit yeah. of hybrid, definitely, yeah. Had to I grab fell on the that. grass. I fell over on that at some point. I got chased out and almost got whipped in the face by a horse, so by its tail, so yeah, I'll never forget that day. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it, though. You got that bit of grass. Though, I've got that you? bit of grass, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, next question. Who's your favourite player at present and why? At present? In the current Arsenal team, yeah. Oh, Martin Odegaard. Uh, at the moment, he's... he's um, He's just playing. He's kind of took that captain's role on. So when he was first given it, and I don't know about you, but I was kind of like, Martin Odegaard. I didn't really expect to see him there. But actually, when you think about the values and what Arsenal stands for, it stands to reason that you've got someone who's just kind of immaculate on and off the pitch, mm. who represent that club, represent that badge. Um, and the way he's been carrying the team of, of, of late, you know, he's been... Aside maybe his Bayern second half, Villa second half. Apart from that, he's he's been phenomenal for us. And physically he's developed and his skill, his touch, his awareness. At the moment, Odegaard's my man, yeah. Man, there's a few, but Odegaard at the moment. Mm. I think at the moment, even like, especially over the last few months for me, even on Sunday, you'd have been at the game Sunday first half. He was head and shoulders the best. Unbelievable. They couldn't get near him. Yeah. You know, literally could not get near him. And he's that good at the moment. Yeah. He doesn't get tackled. He doesn't get tackled. His, his first touch is perfect. It's always away from the defender. He's got his body in between. It, wherever he wants that first touch to go. And that buys him them extra, that valuable extra sort of second or two, which is the difference between pure class and a good player. Mm. Cool. Um. Question 30. We are nearly getting to the end of the questions. If there, <laughs> if there was one manager you would love to have played under, who would it have been and why? Um, it can be any manager. Yeah. Um, I would probably say, let me think here, I would probably go back to, so when I was coming through as a kid, Jack Charlton was a was a, was a was the manager of the borough when he dragged, dragged them up from the second division to the first and he was massive in our in our area. In our locality he was a larger than life kind of character and he i know he went on to ireland and done incredible for them but there was something about big jack charlton and and middlesbrough and just that aura he had and i think i'd, I'd love to have played for him especially in his heyday yeah he was um he was superb for ireland weren't he when you oh, he was incredible i mean God's he's, truth, he, he's took a, like a, a pretty nothing against it the, the irish team at the time but it was a pretty average sort of team across the board if you look back put names on paper and put other teams you'd, you'd pick the other teams all day long but you just kind of created this togetherness about Ireland and just instilled a we will not it's like a siege mentality almost and he was it was perfect they were perfect for each other at the time brilliant right next one's a bit controversial one. Oh no right okay <laughs> what is your thoughts on VAR um, my thoughts um, probably like everybody at the moment, um, there's massive frustration with the time it's taken for decisions to be made. Mm. I don't know whether you watch the Champions League and stuff, but they have these auto like semi-automated systems. Yeah, decisions are made quickly. They seem to be nearly always like absolutely nailed on. There's never any that never controversy. I understand why it was brought in, and I guess the game's got to that point now, which th there's that much money involved that each. In, each decision is so vital and so massive to each club but it has took away the old school feeling of football though mm -hmm. you know there's a there's a part you know when your team scores when you, you you're jumping up and down but you're still looking at the referee you're looking at the yeah. linesman you just you, you can never really um fully let yourself go until it's been confirmed on the board that the goal's a goal mm -hmm. so, so yeah i i understand its implementation it frustrates the life out of me i think some people who are in charge of it um are pretty inept i think it, it it's it's safe to say some of the decisions that have been made this season's criminal um 
But if we can get that right and we use it for all the right reasons, yes, it could be an asset. But if they're going to that system next year, isn't they? I think yeah. next season is that correct? There's talk of it, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, which would be really good. Yeah, because um, it is a bit of a joke, isn't it? There was a game the other yeah. week, weren't it? I think it was a West Ham game, weren't it? There was a disallowed goal, but it went on for about five, six minutes. So you oh, it's, it's just ridiculous, you know. It, it it just sucks the life out of games, you know. You that enthusiasm, that passion you've got, can just win in that five or six minutes, and you sat there waiting for the. In the end, it's just like it, it kind of almost demeans the the, the the decision in the first place. It gets frustrating, but a lot of the time it's right and, it, and, it, and it's helped us out a little bit. I'll tell you what has interested me, though, um, over the course of the season. If you remember right at the start of the season, it was like the games were going on, like injury time was like at least nine, ten minutes, weren't it? Yeah, yeah. Game. That has dropped down, hasn't it, massively over the last few months? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, in fairness to the FA, I think that's been referees clamping down on players time wasting as well yeah um although that still is a massive bugbear of mine but yeah trying to clamp down on time wasters we'll be you know we can talk about martinez all day long but <laughs> these people are out there and they're driving the driving us all crazy with their antics well that was our next question what's your biggest frustration in modern day football that um i think time wasting and cheating is still huge for me um again god forbid if, if one of us ever thought about diving under pat rice my god <laughs> you, you just it would just wouldn't even be worth thought it just wouldn't happen um and to see this happen in these days it, it's it's kind of ten a penny and it, it's just happening too much this whole thing when players go down injured and the referee runs over and says do you need the physio and it takes them about a minute or two to decide whether they want the physio normally they're saying no but three or four minutes later you know that the, the excitement levels have dropped this it's why they do it they're trying to kill the atmosphere of the team that's in the ascendancy mm. it needs to stop we, we may need to somehow put a stop to this because it's getting it's just beyond a joke now and i'll leave you to do the last question mr jones well, last question Oof. can arteta lead arsenal to glory in the next few seasons and do you trust the process yes absolutely wholeheartedly you think that that guy came in and the job that he's done, he inherited a squad with some bad eggs in there, we think. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there were some bad eggs in there. We'd all seen who they were. They'd been at the club for God knows how long. Um, and he's been the one that's came in with the balls enough to actually come and shake things up. But not only that, but because he's an ex-Arsenal player, he understands the values of the club. And maybe he's apart from we're probably one or two players short of having a real, real kind of tour to tour go at City but um, it, it, what he's done for this club is just phenomenal bringing the fan base together um, because it was so toxic let's be honest it was toxic it was awful um, and now there's the kind of that togetherness on and off the pitch and I, that, that is solely down to him and his staff and the players buying into what he he wants to happen and a whole, I, without a shadow of a doubt I think we'll do it yeah to get to the quarterfinals and watching the, the meltdown on Twitter and what have you from some absolute barn pots <laughs> it's the first season in, in the quarterfinals for 15 years and, and we're upset because we lost one nil away to Bayern Munich who normally torture the life out of us the thing is half that them, close sorry sorry to cut you there mate but I was just yeah, gonna sorry. say some of them supporters weren't there for sitting over at the Emirates when we were losing five ones and stuff yeah. like that to Bayern Munich so absolutely and who, just... who are we do you think we got a divine right to go and beat Bayern Munich over two exactly. legs yeah. yes we probably should have gone back to the first leg but Arteta is the man. It'll be an interesting summer this year because I think he's at a stage now when I think three or four players will have to go. Mm. And some quite ruthless decisions might need to be made to free up some capital to bring in what he wants. But I think there'll be some outgoings in the summer that might upset some supporters. But I think Arteta's he knows what he's doing and I fully believe in him. Yeah, no, I, to I totally agree with you. And uh, do you know what? I was gonna, what I'm going to do is kind of go into the Bayern Munich game and then finish yep. up... Um, just talking about obviously um and building a little bit about Scarborough, but obviously watching the game yesterday it was frustrating because do you know what? I actually thought for a good 60 minutes that we was well within the, in that game. And um I thought we showed ourselves in not in a pretty good light compared to what I've seen in the Champions League league over over the last 10 years. Um mm. but for me, it's obviously about now us getting them world-class players in, in the world-class positions. Like, coming out of the game last night, I said, like, a number nine, obviously, is massive. But I think getting someone next to Declan Rice, for me, what I could see last night was the big, is the biggest thing moving forward. 
Mm. Um, and it was just like when we took Jorginho off last night, you could tell that we lost we lost our whole shape at that point. Um, yep. And I like Jorginho, but obviously you can't rely on him every three to four days at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, for me, it's about getting the number six, number nine, and potentially another winger in. Um, I don't know where you kind of think. Is, is that the kind of areas that you're looking at in terms of proceeding uh, in the club moving? And a left forward? back. A, a, a left back for me all day long. I, I think with Tommy Astor is probably our best defending left back at the moment. And he's okay going forwards. I love the guy. I think he's, you know, I think when he's on it, he's he's, he's a great player. But um the other Kiwi and Zinchenko, I'm still yeah. still not fully satisfied with what Zinchenko brings to the table. When he when, when he's playing well in the games, kind of all right. He's, he's, he's good. He can get he can start off our moves. He's always got a mistake in him. Mm. And it's normally a pretty big mistake nearly every match. And you get punished for that. You know, you just you can't legislate for them them sort of mistakes. Um so I think maybe his left back might be a place to to look. And also having a bit of pace down the left hand side, as well as your Martinelli yeah. and maybe Trossard. You want someone kind of bombing down that wing with a bit of pace. If you look at the best teams now, fullbacks are rapid. And we haven't really got that electric pace at either side. And I don't think Julian Timber, as much as he's going to be a very good player, I don't think he's electrically quick, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, going back just very quickly on the other night, I was so disappointed in the, in the overall performance, in, just in the manner that we lost. I think that was the thing that really hurt me the most. There didn't seem to be any sort of belief mm. or even throwing caution to the wind. It, it, there was just, it just felt a little bit flat. It felt like what we were like just before the break to Dubai. Mm. When we went to lost, we just rolled over at Fulham and we were so poor. It was a bit like that last night, um, especially second half, which was very similar to the second half against Villa. I mean, that in itself is kind of worrying that the two second halves in a row, we just fell away. Um, and just the fact that there was nobody, even Odegaard, you know, my man Odegaard, nobody stepped up. No one was prepared to sort of say, right, this is it. I'm going to take the ball by the horns. I'm going to grab this game by the balls and I'm going to drag this team forward. And we've got players in there that we think are there to kind of do that. Your Gabriels, your Salibas, Declan Rice. I mean, these people have got vast experience. So the manner of our loss, Martinelli was a waste of time last night. Saka was a waste of time last night. And it, there's no point beating around the bush. They were, you know, they're phenomenal players when they're on the game. But at the moment, both sides, maybe Trossard apart, it, we're not getting nothing down our sides. There's no plan B with Saka. So that might be an area I saw as linked with um, Elise today. Mm. Maybe that might be an interesting option for us, possibly as well. Yeah, no, it's, de it's, definitely, it's definitely interesting, isn't it? Like, seeing it from your kind of perspective last night. Um, and... It was something else I kind of said, like I said on the watch long last night, that even when we went to Man City and Liverpool, like there was no belief that we could go and actually win the game. I think there yeah. was a belief that we could go there and, and get the point, which we got the point. But I just feel now to go, go to that next stage, we need them additions. Obviously, a world class striker or a top class striker. I don't want to say a yeah. world class. Yeah, yeah. There's not many world class strikers out there. But if you can get a top class striker in and yeah, DM in. It's the leadership as well, isn't it? Like you said last night, it was like we we had no ideas. Once Bayern went one 0 up, that was that that result was done and dusted. That was yeah. literally yeah. what it was going to be. Um, so I think it's it's about identifying the right players. And I suppose the one good thing over the last couple of years is the the progression of the signings that we're making. Um, yeah. I think it's massively improved within the club and I can't be disappointed in terms of what we've recruited, but I do kind of agree with you in terms of the Sinchenko one, but I suppose at the time, Sinchenko and Jesus were good signings. Um, oh, do you know what? I, I, don't want it, I don't want you to think that I don't think Sinchenko's a good yeah. player or anything like that, but at the moment, he's a massive liability. Yeah. Week in, week out when he plays. And at, that, at this level, it, that, that's the difference between you winning the league or being, being within a point or two of the league title. Or someone giving the ball away every single match and giving the team an opportunity to score, which he generally does at some point. It's either giving the ball away, being sloppy in possession. I don't know whether you've seen one of the goals at the weekend. It was like five yards behind the whole back four. I mean, yeah. that's schoolboy stuff. That that's stuff you teach kids. So that was disappointing. Um, so yeah, yeah, we tripped ourselves up a little bit. But it, the fact that there was nobody there to actually grasp it and say, right, come on. I was expecting more from Declan Rice. I'll be honest. Someone West Ham, ex West Ham captain, vast experience with England. Get us together, drive them forward. You be the one that says, right, 
I'll pull us through this. And it didn't seem to be that. And I know we're up against a tough buy inside. It was, their shape was amazing, by the way. I don't know whether you noticed that their shape was incredible. And they just can't, they can't completely nullified us as an attacking force. We were just going sideways, backwards, sideways, backwards. Nobody was taking risks. And at some point, you've got to. The world's best players will take a risk. At the right times and the right places, they'll take a risk. Who did that last night? There's, there's no recollection of anyone going at somebody, whizzing past someone, flicking a shot in, driving a ball across the goal. Did We ever, We never sustained pressure at any point. We're 1-0 down, 10, 15 minutes to go, and we're still not knocking on their door. I don't think Noya made a save second half. That's criminal. Yeah. That's criminal. And I, you do wonder sometimes about, you know, how tired are the players? Yeah. Are they actually tired? Because these guys are like incredible athletes these days. I mean, everyone's looked that they're so looked after and so pampered. Are they that tired, or, or or is there is there a mentality issue when push comes to shove? Is there a possible mentality issue that we need to get past? And I know it, it sounds like we're kind of it, it, it's all doom and gloom because on the last two games, but they're two games that if we genuinely want to go and win Champions League or genuinely want to win the Premiership, you beat Villa and you grind out something against Bayern Munich, or you at least make them think they've been involved in a big game because they didn't come off the pitch. It, it wasn't it wasn't a, a barnstorming performance by any means. And I think that's what we were all hoping for, that, that their goal might even just wake us up, and it didn't. And that was disappointing. Yeah, for that's me, it. anyway. I think that's it, isn't it? There was just no oomph in it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Even Villa on Sunday, there was just no... Right, you know, in, like Bournemouth, I go back to Bournemouth. You know, we were two goals down and the team turned it on. Do you know what I mean? We come yeah. back on 1-3-2. There was none of that I saw on Sunday. There was none of that I saw last night. I don't know if it's fatigue or what it is. Um, yeah, that's I, the I, thing. I totally agree. You just don't know, do you? And then, no. you know, we got, we're going to Wolves at the weekend. Um, who we're not, honestly, these guys, if we're not if we're not on it, they'll, they'll give us a tough game. Yeah. They've got some proper good players over there. And when they put it together in, in, a, in a game... They're dangerous. Didn't they be City at some point? Is it this season, though? Last season, did Wolves do that? Season, Last season, but they, they can do that. So we need to be on the game and you're just hoping that on the back of Villa and that second half at Villa, the second half at Bayern Munich, Actually, in, we, we, in three we, days, we've got to get out of the system and, and move on. Um, it so, was this season. Pardon? It, it was, was this season, wasn't it? It was this was season. It, this, it, yeah, I, I just seem to remember them beating them. And yeah. I've seen Wolves play a few times and thought, Jesus, like these guys are pretty good. And if, if it's one of their games when they're on it, it's a no. It's, it, it, they're in a no-lose situation. Wolves, they're not going down. They're not going up. So they can just go, they come at us with what they've got. They can take risks. It doesn't matter to them. So we've got to be so careful going there. Mm. Yeah, no, I do, I do agree. I think the writing's been on the wall all season. Now. When you start looking at Newcastle away, Aston Villa away, and we, I think every time we do concede first, I think we massively struggle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think it's something that, obviously, Mikel's got to massively look at in the summer in terms of what we do to... Yeah, I mean, going back to Martinelli and Saka, I mean, they would normally pull you through games. They're the players that would kind of just pull out a bit of magic from somewhere. Saka will cut inside, whip a crossing or fire a shot in. Anything just to lift the team. And it, there was just nothing, even from them sort of players who are your players that you're looking at. Even Odegaard went missing second half. It was just, that That's the frustrating thing. And for it to happen two games in a row is, is a big worry. Yeah. But in um, Arteta, we trust we're fine. We'll be fine. We'll Mikel, Super Mikel, will pull it around. I think every season we're going to progress anyway. What we like when we get, yeah. like I said, yeah. like, I think the club are going down the right road of getting the right players in. Without I doubt just think are. it's it's the quantity of players. It's not it's not exactly sorry. It's the quality of player now, isn't it? Like we we can't afford to get it wrong. Mm. We yeah, have to make sure we get it right. I think if you think three years ago, if we had this conversation, we'd be talking about oh God. Can we can we get above eighth can, can we get into the top six can we get into european places and here we are three years later on and we're, we're kind of not happy because we're two points behind city because we lost at home to villa and we've just gone out with the champions league at the quarter final away to Bayern munich when you in the grand scheme of things this club's taken massive strides forward mm -hmm. and we can't forget that 100%. To, to temper that is it's the manner that of our defeat defeats in the last two games which is the worrying thing mm -hmm. So there's a bit of both, isn't there? There's a bit of there's pride in what we're doing as a club. You know, we're back on the map again. We pushed City all the way last season. We're doing it again this season. And don't forget, they're an absolute juggernaut, by the way. You know, possibly flaunting the rules, which we'll I guess we'll find out in the summer. But 
you know, over the years, they've built up a colossal club um, and a colossal football team. It's the best. It is probably the best in the world. I know they lost yesterday, but they battered Madrid. Mm. Um, and on another day, they just scored three or four, and Madrid couldn't have couldn't have argued. But we're up against that, and for two seasons in a row, we're knocking on the door. We're, we're pushing them all the way, and for a club to push them two seasons in a row, as far as what we have, that tells you how far that Arteta has taken us. Mm. And he's still not finished, nowhere near finished yet. So no, yeah, time to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go back, we'll go into Anfield '89 now because I know it's something that I want to <laughs> yeah. discuss with you. Um, obviously, I got his picture up. Um, it was a great squad photo, by the way. Yeah, that was a beauty. Yeah. Um, obviously, you can't see it clearly, but that's kind of the whole squad. Um. Being around around the club in the 89, 89 era, um, yeah. could you always feel that something special was brewing in, in that year? Or was it something... Because obviously we led it a lot of the way, didn't we? Um, the, yeah, the first yeah. division and championship race at the time. Um, but then we seemed to have thrown it away going into that last game. Yeah. No, do you know, at the time, I think it was probably a, a skill of George Graham uh, and Theo Foley, but they never really spoke about it, you know. We'd have quite often have big group meetings it'll be everybody involved so the youth team and reserves and pros and George would stand there and do his little speech about whatever's going on at the time but th th there was never that kind of listen listen guys we can do this it was just literally you focus on your training you focus on what we do well then we've got the game on Saturday we deal with that game and then we'll start thinking about moving on to the next one and the players were never allowed to kind of let the thoughts run away with oh god we've got a chance here he always kept everybody grounded and um towards the end though you could tell that there was there was a bit of excitement in the place and then obviously we thought we'd blew it was it wimbledon we think we drew yeah. it did we draw did we lose to wimbledon or draw i can't remember we drew to but, wimbledon too all didn't we it was dark that's right yeah and, and we all thought oh that's it because liverpool at the time were fantastic weren't they they were brilliant yeah. um so I, I think towards the end there was that time and, and nobody was in the treatment room everybody was fit everybody wanted to play and yeah but I, I, I say i go back to the fact that i think it was george graham's massive asset that he never let players get carried away with what was going on never let them get too big for the boots i mean we had superstars there like paul merson david raw castles that were phenomenal football players never we were never allowed to kind of get too big for the boots um in football and sense you know and, and that, that was one of his massive assets and he always, the week leading up to the game as well, because we played loads of attack v defence with them. So we had to, quite often George would have us as the youth team or the reserves set up as the team they're going to play against. And loads of attack v defence. And and, and, he, and he just instilled into the players. I remember it on that, over the couple of days, he was like, get to half time, don't concede. And I'm telling you, we will get a chance. And he just, it, this this was how he, he approached the match. And to think it just it just played out exactly as he was telling us for that time leading up to the game. It, it's almost like the players went out and they just knew what was what had to be done to get yeah. us over that that finish line. And uh, yeah, it was just a, a masterstroke by by the gaffer, without a doubt. That's what I was going to say. It's an absolute masterclass. Like I I always look at now, and I I tell you, the biggest person I have got respect for that night is that Lino. When that first goal goes in, yeah, because there was a lot panic. of pressure on that to be disallowed, wasn't it? Absolutely, I'd uh, I'd actually been in hospital. I'd had a, a, a few operations, so I'd I'd been at home convalescing. So I was actually sat with my mum and dad in the sitting room watching that. And when Smudger had scored the little flick on header, it was almost like the VAR thing in them. Because we were all waiting to see like, something's not right here. Because all the camera was showing was Liverpool players whinging and mourning, and with, you're thinking, oh well, did he not get a touch? So yeah, absolutely. That that man had balls of steel. That <laughs> linesman, he deserves a medal. But um, yeah, that, yeah, what a night! And what what what, what was what was the place like? like, uh, like it was like just... afterwards, um, being league champions. Um, yeah, going we all went back down. Season. Yeah, there was just, it was just unbelievable just to just to see something like that, which you dream about all your life as a kid. Yeah, and, all, and my my club are actually walking around with this trophy and seeing all the guys just i was just a massive release of of just the, the whole emotions of the season and i think that was the beauty of the club 
then is that we all felt involved as well because we were the ones training with the first team all week. We were the ones that were kind of set up as the opposition, you know, and all that. So, so we, in, in a very small way, like kind of contributed to the guys doing so well on a on a um, on the Saturdays. But uh, there was a huge do at um, I think the place was called In on the Park or something like that. I can't remember. There was a massive place in central London. And there was a huge do there, which was like a big champions do. And it was unbelievable. Like just seeing everyone letting their hair down, having a few beers, even the gaffer and stuff. And it was just, uh, it was pretty special times. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like for me, it was one of the obviously first things. Um, mm. that I mean, first thing I always ever remember is the 1986 League Cup final when we beat Liverpool. And yeah. even in, in that game, if Liverpool scored first, they never lost, and I think there was a there was a, yeah. there was a record at the time. If Ian Rush scored first, that's right. Liverpool had never lost a game before that. Yeah, um, yeah. So, like as you said, they were like the Man City juggernaut team, weren't they? Of yeah, they of were. that generation, and yeah, I don't think it's talk, even now. Yeah, right. Like, don't get me wrong, it's talked big enough, but I don't think I don't think people realise nowadays how big that was and how massive that performance was to go to Liverpool and win two 0 at their ground. Unbelievable. I mean, that place was a fortress. Nobody went there and scored a goal, or scored a goal, let alone score two goals and stop them from scoring. Mm. John Barnes is playing. I mean, the guy was a wizard. Mm. Um, and, you know, he tore the league apart, but we just went there. Just that, we were rock solid that year, though. You know, there was, it wasn't a flashy team by any means, but by God, there was just a togetherness about us at, at that particular time. And they'd have ran through war zones for each other them guys and and i think that was something that george took maybe individually as, as footballers you might have took liverpool players over more of our players but actually as, as a togetherness there was nothing that would that could ever break what he, what george had put had instilled into that into the club at that time it's unbelievable. and as being, and being an, atta like an a, a, attacking player like yourself yeah. as such um you'd been playing against the likes of in training, David O'Leary, Tony Adams, Steve Bold. Um, yeah. What was it like to play against? Because these, these, these are absolute legends of the game, if we're being totally honest, sure. Yeah. Um, what was it like to like, play against these on a day to day? Oh, it was business? magic. Because ultimately, because they were good guys, so there was never any, any any animosity. There was never any kind of, no Mickey taking. There was just complete respect. And you knew that when you went to play with the first team, you had to take your game up to, a, to somewhere like it's never been before. Yeah. But you wanted to do that because... You wanted to show them that you could be you could mix it with the best and by the same token you knew that what you were doing was going to benefit the club as a whole on the weekend because of the game that we had coming up so whatever we did with with the first team um it was just all there was just always this togetherness you know pre-season it was just all together running our balls off at trent park and then um but it was just george graham it had to be together all the coaches just everybody every, everything we did was always as a, as a big unit um so that brothers in arms kind of mentality was it's probably a bit old school like, when, when i think back like pat rice was like an old sergeant major really when i think back to how he was with us but the respect we had for the man because we knew what he'd done for the club as well you know i remember the first talk he had with us and he stood there talking and i'm thinking you listed the fa cup up <laughs> it's just like you know this is the cup that we used to watch on a saturday we'd, we'd wait all season for saturday mm. pat rice had lifted the cup and i'm i'm sat there thinking i was in dream world like He's, he's my coach for the next two years. You know, I'm going to see him every single day. I couldn't stand the bloke for a long time, man, because he was scary as anything. But uh, <laughs> he was class, yeah. But uh, yeah, I've got another picture, and um, this oh, yeah. this is a, this is quite a fast forward now. But I just want to talk about another <coughs> legend. Um, obviously, you was at the um, last game. Oh, of yeah, the Emirates. My, of my son and I Bender. went to the Emirates, yeah, for the Bengals last game. Yep, still got my T-shirt, by the way. Um, yeah, I've actually got two yeah. of them tucked away. Do you um, know, really sadly, I, I got the XXL one on that day. Well, it's massive, but it fits me really snug quite now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank God for Venga. Um, yeah, um, let's talk about injuries for 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 a few minutes. Um, what what a man he was, and obviously, he obviously coming out of the George Graham era. Obviously, we went yeah. into the Bruce Rock, which would never never worked out so obviously for, for no. different reasons but this bloke come in didn't he and um changed the whole culture of the club and pretty much the whole premier league without a shadow of a doubt and i think what also gets forgotten when it comes to Wenger is david dean's impact on him as well david dean yeah. was the one that kind of negotiated that 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 
for Wenger to come in because let's be honest, none of us had heard of him. Mm. We were all scratching our heads thinking, well, his name sounds like Arsenal, but that, that's <laughs> about it really. Do you know what I mean? No, nobody knew him. And yet David Dean knew he was bringing in a guy who was levels above people in, in the way that his his thinking was so far forward and so so different to what we had over here. But David Dean recognised that, but also the fact that he came in and also brought on the values of the club. And, and you know, Wenger was always about class and and he, he'd talk about the way that he wanted Arsenal to be and seen across the world and, and how we are seen across the world now. And a lot of that's down to Arsene Wenger. Yeah, an absolute fantastic man. Yeah, incredible, incredible. <laughs> Amazing. Um, any other questions for you, Jonesy? Anything you want to kind of ask, Andy? Um, no, I just went to say when Liam was talking about you know playing with the first team. Did any of the boys that that back four, that famous back four, did any of them not hold back in the tackle on you? All of them. When it, you know, when it comes to the end, honestly, it was horrible because like you have like Steve Bald or Tony Adams come flying into tackles with you, and you're like, oh god, like these guys, <laughs> these guys were massive, and when they hit you, you stayed hit. But it, again, it, it kept us on our toes. You know, mm. we, were, we were kind of decent footballers as well, so we could, you know, we, we had to work really hard to get round them. But what a unit they were, though. Honestly, playing against them four was like it was so so difficult. Even just in training, Dixon, Nigel Winterburn, them two guys. I mean, it's just like I, they were just incredible as a unit. They just kind of knew what each other were doing. But George, that's again going back to George Graham. Every day, no matter what the training was, it would always end up with a back four. And then he put the couple of midfielders in front, and that would be the block, and then everything was just around that. So, but playing with them was just, yeah, it was class. But you didn't want to get too near Tony Adams or Steve Bold. Did you get a few goals past them? We did, but it, it was just a few. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We actually did not. We didn't score that many. Um, if Kevin Campbell was playing, that that would be we had a better chance because he could knock them around a little bit, mm -hmm. um, or he could physically stand up to them. Whereas they would just batter us a lot. But um, <laughs> yeah, Andy Cole was a good one for them games because he was quite quick as well. He'd make little slippy runs down the side of them. Yeah. Used to hate him for it. But uh, yeah, yeah, there were the days. Yeah, they were, I, was, I was about to say let's just talk about a little bit about Kevin Campbell. And you just mentioned Andy Cole as well. Yeah. Um, obviously, two players that went on to be um, really good players in the Premier League. Obviously, yeah. Andy Cole's probably a little bit of an, a legend, if we're being totally honest, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. What were, they, what, were they, what were they both like in. Um, but, uh, just do you know what they're both proper just great class guys absolutely down to earth Coley was a bit quieter than Kevin Kevin was a, a bit larger than life he was quite funny and quite loud and um, he was an absolute unit on the pitch you know you, it was always good when you walked out to, onto a match and you'd walk out on the pitch and you've seen you had Kevin there you've got David Hillier Stephen Morrow Pat Scully some big units there you always felt pretty safe going into matches and you knew they'd look after you as well so that us players that can maybe try and play a little bit had free reign to go and do that. But, uh, yeah, I'm off track there. What, what was your question again? I completely forgot what you yeah, said. Yeah, I was just saying, what was it like with, with them both playing? Oh, yeah, into... just unbelievable. Honestly, just unbelievable. And I can't get through to people enough. Like, if, if ever I talk about the days gone by, is just these these are just, these were like normal people. Mm. Just proper grounded blokes that want to know how you settled, how you settled in your digs. George Graham used to phone up people at the digs, like out of his, in his own time, phone people up and say, I'd be even. Everything else you need from the club. It was just that that's what it was like. And they're things that a lot of people won't ever see about what things that have gone on like, kind of behind the scenes almost. But that was that togetherness that um, that the club had at the time, which I'm pretty sure they take through even now to this day. Yeah, it's like to be fair, like even now, even on social media, like Kevin Campbell has a lot of interaction with us as fans. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's it's nice because obviously these were players that when I was growing up that I looked up to as kind of my heroes in the, in yeah. the late eighties, early nineties. So it's it's lovely that they, they, they that they interact with the fans like they do now. So oh, it's, it, that that is one of the one of the the, the the massively positive things about social media. There's there's, there's obviously negatives which we seen yeah. last night with all the trolls coming out with all this spilling their vile stuff about the lads but yeah that that part of it but yeah kevin interacting and stuff is great it's, it's great for a lot of people because they'll get to see him for who he is and he's just a, he's just a good bloke he's just a great guy mm. loves arsenal i'm not sure about his dicky balls these days he never wore them <laughs> out he'd have got slaughtered for that but um yeah uh, and coley was just a bit different coley was a bit quieter different sort of players kevin was more robust power strength whereas Corley was a bit more live a bit more skill about him just as sharp and just as good a finisher but he was always slightly behind Kevin at, at Arsenal 
which I think was what stifled his progress there mm. before he went to Bristol City, then when he went to Newcastle when he really kicked on. But that was yeah. that Coley's mentality is phenomenal though. You know, he just no matter how he played on a day, you just if you just knew if you give him a chance he'd put it, it he would stick it away. He wouldn't let things get him down. And I think that's what's been a massive help for him through his career as well. Well, like you said at the start of the show, like leaving Arsenal's not an easy thing. So he took it by t- both hands, really. Yeah, didn't he? totally, totally. Um, it, he left in a different way. He wasn't released by Arsenal. It was just yeah. agreed that he got to City, I think, to Bristol City at the time. But yeah, it was. It, he's just again. You can see there was lots of good players in the youth team in the Resies, Um, but there was always that one or two where you just knew there was that something. There was just something almost in their eyes, like David Hillier. There was just something about Dave. You just knew he was going to go on and do really well. Ray Parler, when he used to play in the youth team with us, there was there was just something about them. He might not be the best player on the pitch, not the quickest player on the pitch, not the most skillful player on the pitch, but there's just kind of, of a presence about certain players that, that were there. And Arsenal were very good at recognising them players mm. um, and just bringing these, these people through. So, yeah, Ray Parler's career is all down to me. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there's, a, there's another legend, isn't there? Like, in terms of, yeah. I remember his de- debut. I think it was a bad debut, weren't it? Liverpool give away a penalty and everything. But, yeah. Like, yeah, and you know, I'd, I'd moved on when he made his debut. And there was a part of me that was so surprised to see Ray Parler playing for Arsenal. I was like, never, <laughs> never in this world. Like, he's brilliant because he's a class bloke. Yeah. But then, then you see him go on to then become in the first 11 every single week and then you know he goes on to score the fa cup goal and actually he went to play for, he went to play to the, at the borough for a bit um maybe for a season or a season or two at the end of his career but uh yeah just another one of them players that just had that little something extra stephen morrow had it yeah it's interesting isn't it? i suppose sometimes having that lucky break as well isn't it i guess um yeah yeah without doubt it is yeah and a lot of players will kind of they'll tell you that yeah, loads of it's down to ability, but you do need a bit of luck. Like like you, any walk of life. But yeah. Have you seen players that you thought, I can't believe they didn't make it? Yeah, loads. Honestly, loads, loads of players that I know, maybe individually at that time, would have been technically better than the players that have actually gone on to make it. But that's down to the the, the, the coaches and the staff at the club to recognise them players that maybe aren't quite the kind of the back page boy, but the ones who just Every week, eight or nine out of ten. The worst they get to seven out of ten, and that's where your Ray Parlers, your Dave Hilliers, them Paul Merson, Tony Adams, they they all come through with that, you know. And but I, I know phenomenal players that just that, that didn't make it. That just, yeah, just didn't quite get there. It was a golden era when you think about it, wasn't it? Around that time as well for the the um the kids coming through, and it, it must have been harder than ever in, mm. in terms of competition because it was so many yeah. players. Yeah, it was, but by the same token, it was because of that that was another reason why going to Arsenal was like, they, they give kids a chance. Yeah. You know, David Rocastle, Michael Thomas, Paul Davis, Tony Adams. I mean, it's just Niall Quinn. It, it was just mm-hmm. a, con, a, a constant turnover of good local players coming through the youth teams, coming through the reserves, understood what Arsenal was all about and what it was to wear that shirt. And the pride that you took in wearing that shirt, and I sometimes think some players don't have that anymore. Mm. Um, but that's what it was all about. And when they they were kind of the the bread and butter of all your, your setups, you'd maybe buy the odd one or two really good class players around them. But they were the ones that were fundamental to the success. They knew what it was to play for Arsenal. They knew what it was to win for that club, and how much they wanted to win for each other because that's what the coaches instilled. Proper old school, but it was just uh, just incredible, really. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, obviously, I'd love to talk all night, but yeah. obviously, I know obviously times are factor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Past ten, Andy, I just want to say a massive thank you for obviously, firstly, um, reaching out to me, but coming on tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thanks um, for having me. And if you ever want to come back on, we're more than well. You're more than welcome. Anytime. If, if you're struggling for people to make up your numbers, um, and if everybody was uh, was all right with what we've been talking about, then yeah, I'll come on any time. It's no problem. Oh, no, it's been absolutely fantastic, mate. An absolute hour and 15 minutes. I've enjoyed listening just to oh, fantastic. You know, your career and obviously everything all, all about Arsenal, really. So thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. And thank take you. Care, anything, guys. anything for yourself, James? No, just to thank you as well, Andy. I'm like, obviously a bit younger than you guys. I don't know rub it in. <laughs> but it's just, you know, my dad lived through it. I lived through the 89 with it. I was only three, but just to hear your perspective. Uh, yeah. I know 
he's going to watch it back when he gets home from work, he said. So, uh, yeah. just thank you for coming on tonight. It's been brilliant. Oh, it's been a pleasure. It's been lovely meeting you guys as well. Um, obviously, thank you for everyone who's obviously come into the chat and obviously come on tonight. Um, we really appreciate your support as always. Um, just to look ahead to kind of shows for the next um, next week, we will be. I will be back on for a watch along on Saturday night on Ryan's channel. Um, I'm going to put myself for it all again. Um, so that'll start <laughs> at 7 p.m. for a 7:30 kickoff. Um, fingers crossed we can get the three points on the board and get some confidence back within the team. Um, the title race is not over yet. Just want to remind everyone that. Not by a long shot. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and also, we'll look, we'll start planning to full shows um, from Sunday onwards, and we'll put, put them out on Twitter and on our YouTube pages in due course. Um, obviously, thank you yet again to Andy for obviously offering his services tonight. Thank you, Mr. Jones, once again. Yeah, and the Cannon and Jonesy show will be back next Thursday. And it will be back, and someone has got to do a forfeit which is me. So <laughs> um, this has been waiting for a few weeks. I'm like, I hope James has got a good one. I've got a good one. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Not looking forward to it. Have a great evening, guys, and have a great, also a good weekend, and we'll catch up soon. Good night. All right. Take care. Thanks, guys.